child life specialist. And um, most people well, have never even heard of a child life specialist. I hadn't until I had some interactions in a hospital also. And basically, a child life specialist is someone who works to minimize the stress of hospital or ill children and families and promote optimal development and growth. So that encompasses a lot. But the majority of what I do is I do a lot of play in the hospitals. Um, and you can learn more about a person in an hour of play than you can in a year of conversation. You see people express things, how they cope. Um, all of that can be seen through play. So this is my comfort level, play. <laughs> Let's play a little game. Let's look at these medic. These are pictures. But they also, in a child's mind, at their developmental level, can be representative of a medical term that may be very confusing to them. Does anyone have any idea what these, a child may think related to these in medical terms? Oh, okay. um, I, someone's got an idea. Measles. Measles? Which one? The dot, OK, all right. Measles? Any other ideas? Who got it? Yay, congratulations. Ivy is the one, the plant there. And when kids come to the hospitals, or kids need blood draws, or kids need injections, sometimes they hear the word Ivy. And these are the kind of things that they think about. Um, the other one there is tube. Anytime a kid's got to get medicine through any kind of IV, I'm just hooking your medicine into your tube. Those are the kind of things that kids think. Part of my job in the hospital is to help kids understand what these things mean in a medical setting. All right, I'm going to give you guys a second chance. Here's a couple more. Blood draw. Blood draw. You guys are on it now, huh? <laughs> Cat scan. Good, I heard it over there. And then the last one um, is actually a picture that a child drew when we told them the word stretcher. So a lot of kids go on a stretcher at the hospital, and they literally thought that someone was going to take their arms and legs and stretch them. So this is really where my profession comes from, trying to help people and families understand medical terms, feel more comfortable in the hospital, and finding a way to promote that growth and development of kids and families in these stressful situations. So we do a lot of play. We, um, we talked about we do medical play, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, we do normalization play. We do therapeutic play to help children express their feelings. Um, and then we also do developmental play. So for those kiddos that are in the hospital for a long time or maybe isolated from social settings, uh, we can help them continue to grow their developmental skills. So just a quick couple other things that we do as child life specialists. We do do some education. I was not trained as a doctor. So I don't have that depth of education. But what I do know is I can work with those medical professionals to find language that children can understand. So they can have some sort of mastery and some sort of knowledge over their own disease and what's going on with their body. The next part is procedural preparation. So I help talk kids through what to expect when it comes to any kind of medical procedure. That could be a surgery. That could be an MRI. That could be a blood draw. It could be a lot of different things. And I'll talk a little bit more about preparation as it how specifically relates to blood draws. Some other things we do is procedural support and coping. So we've now talked to them about what to expect. The next part is coming up with a plan and how to help them get through this. We also do some psychosocial care for the children, the caregivers, and the siblings. And then we do also do bereavement support. So we already talked a little bit about language choices, but one of the things that can help make procedural things or experiences better is by using positive language. So there are a lot of people that fall into, oh, we're going to the hospital, you're going to get a poke, it's going to hurt. Well, you've now set that child up to expect, I'm going to hurt. Now I don't want to go, and I don't want to have to do this. Where you can use some softer language. So these are just a couple examples. Um, the doctor needs a small sample of your blood to look at under a microscope. We can, that's how we can talk about a blood draw. And then as your child has maybe more questions, we can dig a little deeper into what information might be most helpful for them. Um, when it comes to language choices around how it will feel, some kids say they feel a poke, while others just feel pressure. 
You let me know how it feels for you. Then we're not setting kids up for a certain expectation when we don't know what it will feel like for them. So the next step is we've got some great language choices now to maybe talk to kids about going to get this blood work done or to get an IV. Um, the next step is how do we prepare those kids for those procedures? So the first thing um, is knowing your child. You guys know your children best. And so kind of identifying what type of coper your child is. There are some kids um, that are the catastrophizer. That's the first one. Anything that happens, it's going to be the worst. It's all blown out of proportion, and that's just who they are. And so they're going to require a different level of information prior to going to procedures. Um, there are the sensitizers. There are those people that hold things in. Um, there are the information seekers. There are the people that are going to not deny it until they're there in the moment. And so identifying what kind of coper your child is is going to be very helpful in knowing how much information do I share and at what time do I share this information. And I know Hope has a flyer that she can send to parents that actually has the link to these different types of copers. So if you're interested in the details of what's on this slide, Hope can get it to you. So now you've identified what kind of child you have, what kind of coper they are, what kind of information might be helpful. The first thing is, a lot of pe some people fall into that, well, if I just don't tell them, and as soon as we get there, we deal with it, that's going to be better. There's a lot of research around the fact that telling kids something's going to happen and talking through that process actually decreases anxiety and stress and increases compliance. Because now I know when I get that smelly, stinky soap on my arm, it's supposed to smell like that. And that I know it's going to be cold and wet. And we can come up with a plan on what to do for that if they have sense issues. So telling kids very often is more helpful than withholding information. I'm not going to lie, there are some kids out there that don't do well with that. I have a couple kids on my caseload right now that the family and I have decided that's not helpful. But overall, most of the time, it's important to talk to kids about what's going to happen. The child's age helps determine when and how much information you should share with them. So those itty bitties, those toddlers, those preschoolers, the morning before you go, maybe the night before, hey, we're going to go to the doctor, or we're going to go to the hospital, and they need to take a small sample of your blood. We're going to do that tomorrow morning. They just don't have the attention span to remember that more than that time frame. But those teenagers, for one, they probably know they're going. Um, but you know, a couple days, a week, as much heads up as they would like, they can have. Those school agers, you've got to kind of determine, is it a couple days? Is it a week? How early do I feel like my child needs that specific information? <coughs> um, and then being honest is really important, too. Because if we aren't honest with kids, we set them up for false expectations, and then we lose our trust. And once your trust is lost with kids, it's very, very hard to earn back. So even if you don't want to, if you don't like going to the hospital, I'm going to tell you we need to go there and get your blood drawn. We're going to figure out how to get this through the, together. Again, using that kind of soft language is helpful in that point, too. And then the final step about preparation is actually using the language and teaching children what to expect when they go. So I, this is really focused on blood draws. So I tried to come up with some very simple steps that might be helpful in educating kids who have to go get a blood draw. So kind of the first one we talk about um, is that cleaning agent, whether it's alcohol, whether it's chloroprep. There's a lot of different kinds. But you're going to feel that cold, wet liquid on your arm where they clean. And it might have a little bit of a smell. Talking to kids about all the senses they're going to feel is very important, too. Um, kids have a different level of alertness to all their senses. So smell, feel, the things they might hear are important for them to talk, to talk about also. So the first thing is I would talk about the smell, the cool, wet, cleaning solution they're going to use. The next part, which is for some kids the hardest part, is that tourniquet that they sometimes have to put on. And we talk about that as that tight rubber band at the hospital. Um, and it's just going to give a tight hug around your arm. The next thing you're going to feel is you'll feel some pressure or a poke. Those are the two words that I try to use with kids to let them, again, let them determine 
how it feels, but to give them some concept of what they might feel. Um, and then giving them a job is important too. So your job is to hold still as the blood is collected. If you need to scream, if you need to cry, those things are all okay. Your job is to be as still as you can. Um, and then the last step for them is they're gonna do, they're gonna put a Band-Aid on. So those are some, just some very simple steps that you guys might be able to use to help kids as you have to go in and get blood draws. So I said I was gonna talk a little bit about medical play. Um, these are kind of two examples of medical play depending on what age your child is. Becoming familiar with equipment um, can be very helpful in making blood draws successful. So on the one side, there's just the, for those little kids, those preschoolers, those young school agers, sometimes just pulling out a medical kit. The reality is every preschool age, Fisher Price, whatever medical kit you have, is gonna have a shot in it because it's part of kids coping and part of them practicing and playing doctor. So you can practice, oh, how did that feel for you? Oh, was it pokey? Did it feel like pressure? Um, and you can kind of practice some of those steps I talked about in the previous slide with some of this equipment. Sometimes when you're in the hospital, you actually get to use real medical equipment to do this. So depending where you are and what kind of resources you have, um, they may be able to let a kid stretch the tourniquet themselves and actually put it on um, their own doll or animal. Um, and they can actually use the actual tubes to collect the blood. So that can be very helpful um, to use some of that real medical equipment for those older kids. It's like, mm, that's baby stuff. Um, so the next thing is going to come back up. But since we're talking about preparation for procedures, I wanted to just clarify a couple things um, about the difference between a blood draw, an IV, and an IM injection. Um, because I think there's a lot of misconceptions around the difference between all of those. So blood draws are a needle that's inserted into your vein and they collect some blood out through a tube. Um, IVs are different in the sense that they go into that same vein, but they leave a little plastic straw catheter in there and they withdraw the needle. And through that catheter, they can give fluids, they can draw blood. Um, and then the final kind of poke that we talk about often is an intermuscular shot. And I know that's not something you guys try to avoid with this population, but that is a, um, a needle that goes actually through the fat and into some of the muscle of your body. So those are just the quick, there were a lot of misconceptions around that when I first started my job, so I just thought I would do a quick little medical review. So if you're having to prepare your child for a blood draw versus an IV, you might be able to talk about that thin straw is how we talk about it in the hospital. It's the tiniest straw and it's gonna go in those little blue lines in your hand. Um, that's a difference between the blood draw and the IV. So we've talked about what kind of coper your child is. We've talked about soft, soft language and language choices. We've talked about a little bit how to prep a child for procedures. The next part is how do we support them through this? So great, we've done all this upfront work to try to make this as easy as possible, but it's not easy. So um, what are some ways that once we're there, we're in the moment that we can support these kiddos? Um, we're gonna go back to language choices. It's very easy for people to fall into the, oh, you're okay, you're okay, you're fine, it's okay. I know you're upset, but you're okay. The problem with that is this child does not feel okay. They are very stressed out, they're very fearful, and this can be potentially traumatic for them. So we really try to stay away from those words um, and use something like, this is really tough, you're being very brave. That is a little more validating for a child than to hear you're okay. Um, it's almost over, again, people just tend to fall to that because they want the kid to think they're almost done. But what is almost over? It's very ambivalent. You know, are we gonna be here another 10 minutes? Is your almost 10 minutes or is your almost three minutes? Um, so, just being specific, they need to collect the blood and then they're gonna put a Band-Aid on. Those are the two things left that we need to know about. Um, you're doing such a good job. When a child is dealing with that stress and having trouble coping, being told you're blanketly doing a good job, they sometimes feel a little lied to. 
because I'm not doing a good job. I know I'm screaming at the top of my lungs. I'm having a really hard time holding still. So I don't feel like I'm doing a good job. So if you're very specific about what they're doing well, um, it's a little more validating for kids. So, wow, you're really holding mom's hand really tightly. I hope that helps. Or, oh, your arm is so still. Or, oh, you're taking, doing a great job taking some deep breaths. Um, so just thinking about language choices. The other thing that's listed there is one voice. Um, sometimes those stressful situations can also become very loud. And we can add to some of those stressful situations. So there's some research around trying to have one person talk to that child so that they're not hearing input from all over. It's kind of like when you're watching the television and you're trying to have a conversation on the phone and then your child's trying to talk to you all at the same time. You're like, which piece of information am I supposed to listen to? Um, so if you can try to have just one person giving directives, that can be very helpful. Um, so I know you guys are going to have a whole presentation on pain management right after me, so he's going to dwarf my little pain management here. But these are some numbing creams, freezy sprays, things that can help reduce the amount of pain a child may feel from any kind of poke. Um, the first one is a topical numbing cream. It's called LMX or EMLA. The doctors can prescribe these. These can also be found over the counter. Um, any of these I highly encourage you talk to your doctor about before you use, just to make sure that it works for you and your body and that there wouldn't be any. I did ask, are these all appropriate for you? Um, families here? And they said yes, but I would just caution to make sure you ask somebody. But really, the numbing cream is literally, it's like lotion. You just put on wherever they think they might have a poke. Um, you put some sort of like occlusive dressing over the top is what we call it at the hospital, one of those clear tegaderms or um, to contain it so it doesn't just squish all over. But that can be really hard for some kids because it's really sticky. And sometimes Band-Aids coming off and tape coming off is worse than anything else. So what we often suggest to families is um, the Glad Press and Seal because what you do is you put your glob on, you put the press and seal over, you press all around, and now you don't have something sticky coming off. It just slides right off like saran wrap. So if you're going to use those numbing creams, that's another, another way to kind of reduce pain and not have such a sticky mess. Um, buzzy, it's, that little boy has the buzzy. He's using it for his blood draw. And the buzzy is, um, it looks like a bee. They actually make them in uh, ladybugs now, too. It's a little vibrating piece with a set of the blue piece is um, like a gel pack that we'd use if you got hurt at home. You fell. Um, so those slide behind the buzzy. And so the vibration and the cold confuse the nerves. And so it makes the pain, um, it makes the poke less painful. What I love about this, there are very few populations that cannot use this. This was actually developed by an emergency room physician for her son who had a needle phobia. Um, so you can purchase these online for like $30 or $40. I, <coughs> I actually bought one for my nephews when they were born so that when they started getting immunizations, my sister could take them to every immunization with them. Um, the one thing I warn you about Buzzy is it is cold. So depending on what age your kid is, we find those toddler preschoolers sometimes have a hard time with the cold because the cold causes more pain to them than the poke might. So that's going to be one of those assessments where you can use with your kid um, to figure out what is best. Although you can also use the buzzy without the wings. And as they age through that process of that preschool, early school age where they don't like the cold, you can just add the wings back on later. Um, and then there are a couple other things. There's something called a Sonera patch. And that's something that has to be prescribed and would usually be put on at the clinic or um, the lab that you go. Um, and it is a combination of a numbing medicine and some heat. So again, the one thing I warn about this is it can be, it, it is a sticker. And so if your kid has trouble getting Band-Aids off or things like that, this might not be something you want to pursue immediately. But again, if they grow out of that or get a little more comfortable with that, you can do the Sonera patches. And then the last one is also something that has to be prescribed or you have to get through a doctor, but it's Freezy Spray. What I like about Freezy Spray is it's immediate. 
So you spray it, it makes your hand numb. You can actually sometimes see the frosty um, pieces of hair when they spray it. Um, but it's quick. You don't have to wait on it. Um, what I didn't mention about the numbing cream is that it does take 30 minutes to an hour to sit on the skin to be effective. So there's kind of pluses and negatives to each of these, um, but we have found that all different kind of kiddos have enjoyed different types of these to help and have been helpful for their blood draws. So the next part is actually um, a video that they're gonna load up for me because it didn't flow into my presentation the way that IT needed it. Hold on one minute, okay. Um, but this is just another support piece. So we talked a little bit about language choices, pain management. The next thing we use is something called positions of comfort. And there's all kinds of research that as soon as you lay someone down to try to do something to them and you have all these people standing over the top of them, your anxiety automatically increases. You're in a very vulnerable position. Um, so what we do is we try to make, get kids in a position that is more comfortable for them where they feel less threatened and more comforted. And that's why it's called positions of comfort. Um, this is also something that you'll have to work with your specific child on to see what is most appropriate. Um, so sometimes you can sit your child just, he's gonna try to pull up the video, but for a child, um, you can kind of sit them on their lap and you can kind of bear hug them. And you can keep an arm outside here on a table and then that child, you can whisper in their ear if they have favorite songs they wanna sing. You can do those kind of things. And the child feels hugged and comforted as opposed to pinned down. So there are a lot of different ways um, that you can use positions of comfort for different ages. This is something that you typically use for like school agers and younger. Once they get too big to sit on your lap or once they get too big, um, it becomes unsafe for families and staff. Comfort positioning is a practice that allows children to sit up and feel secure during their medical procedure, decreasing anxiety and increasing cooperation. Staff should acknowledge the expertise of the parent and invite them to assist in planning for the comfort position. This allows the child to feel more in control of their environment and receive active support from their parents. The provider should assign roles for both the parent and the child and coach them through this process. The parent and child's desire and ability to participate safely is important, as well as any past experiences that might need to be addressed prior to implementing a comfort position. Using things like topical anesthetics, distraction and diversion, a child life specialist, appropriate language, and one calming voice to reassure the patient can also help the procedure run more smoothly. The first comfort position is the straddle position. In this position, the patient sits upright on their parent's lap facing them. They will be positioned torso to torso. The parent secures the child's arm and head by holding them in a hugging position. In this position, the child's trunk is immobilized, preventing the patient's ability to swing legs back and forth so that the child's arm or leg can be easily accessed by medical staff. Movement of the child in the parent's lap does not impact movement of the extremity being held by a separate staff member. This position is ideal if the child prefers not to watch the procedure, such as during IV starts, blood draws, and injections, as well as a number of other procedures. The next position is the side sitting position. For this position, the patient sits upright and sideways on a parent's lap. The parent secures the child's arm and head by holding the child in a hugging position. The side sitting position is an alternative comfort position for older children who may feel more secure and less confined. It provides a mobilization and prevents the child's ability to swing legs back and forth so that their arm or leg can be easily accessed by the medical staff for the procedure. Similar to the straddle position, the movement of the child in the parent's lap will not impact movement of the child's extremity held by a separate staff member and is ideal for a patient who prefers not to watch the procedure. This position has proven to work well for IV starts, blood draws, injections, ear checks, and vitals. The last position is the front to back position. In this comfort position, the child sits upright on the parent's lap with their back against the parent's torso. 
The parent then places an arm around the child's torso in a hugging position. The child's leg can be secured by the wrapping of the parent's legs around the child's legs. This position ensures trunk immobilization and prevents the child's ability to swing legs back and forth so that the child's arm or leg can be easily accessed by medical staff. In this position, movement of the child doesn't impact the extremity that's being held by a separate staff member. This position is ideal if the child wants to watch the procedure and works well with a variety of procedures such as NG placement, port access, and a number of other procedures. I have been a nurse here for over 30 years and I will tell you I was a hard sell. But as I've done them um, and gotten comfortable with them, I, this is the only way I do them. For my kids and in my situation, if I was to hand them off to a wonderful and caring and kind nurse, um, they would feel like their mom had left them in, in the middle of pain. And so I, I longed for them to know that I was near. And, and so to be able to hold them, it's empowering to be able to say, I can comfort you in the middle of something sad. So that's just a quick little video about positions of comfort. Obviously, those are going to be very specific to your child um, and maybe what procedure may be happening. Uh, but what I love about it, it's a, it is a way to empower parents to feel like they can do something for the kids in these really tough times. So he's pulling up the next slide for me. But um, what you saw is you saw some, you, I don't know if you observed, but there were some people holding books. There were some people blowing bubbles. Um, and this is considered coping and distraction. It's part of the way that we help kids deal with some of the pain. Um, so the first couple of things when it comes to coping and distraction and coming up with a plan on how to help your child deal with this procedure is, does your child like to watch or are they someone that likes to look away? Um, I can tell you from personal experience, if someone tells me I can't look, my anxiety immediately goes up. So there are people that like to watch and there are people that don't like to watch. I feel like oftentimes medical professionals will say, don't watch, don't watch, don't watch. And I've actually seen someone push a kiddo's head away. Um, but I knew that kiddo well enough that that kiddo needs to watch to cope. And so I had to do some education to that um, medical professional. One of the next things you need to kind of ask yourself when it comes to planning what to do and how to help your child cope is, um, does your child want to know the steps beforehand? So do they want to know, here's the cold, wet soap, Here's the tourniquet. Or do they just not want to know and focus on something else completely? Um, and the third thing I always try to find out too, does the child want to help with something? Because there's always something a child can help with in a procedure. Whether it's shaking the blood tubes once they're, once they're connected, whether it's cleaning something. Um, if a child wants involvement in that, we should try to make that happen. This is their body and their experience. Um, so those are some of the questions I would ask before coming up with a plan for kiddos. So if they're a watcher, it's kind of it. We're going to help you watch, um, use some language that's helpful. But if your kiddo what, likes to be distracted, there are some things listed on the side there that can be distracting. So for our younger kids, something as simple as bubbles, you know, because they can watch them or they can pop them as they're over here. Um, things like light up wands and I spy books can be helpful. Bubbles are not only good just for looking and popping, but if you have a child blow them, what I love about bubbles is they're playful and kids don't know it, but they're having to take deep breaths, which we know do physiological things in your body to help calm you down. So you can't blow a bubble by going You have to go So we're teaching kids deep breathing by blowing bubbles. You can use any kind of tablet for video games um, or for any kind of videos or shows you'd want to watch. For some of our older kids, it's something like music. They even just plug in their iPhone or their whatever phone they have and put their earphones in and listen to whatever music they want right there. Um, deep breathing I mentioned a little bit about. And then another big one is having someone's hand to hold or maybe a stress ball to squeeze when they start to feel any kind of pain. So those are some distraction type things that might help on top of the pain management and on top of the voices, the um, good language choices and the one voice and the positions of comfort. And then there's just one last slide here that I wanted to review because I know parents and the people sitting in this room are often the people that deal with this challenge the most and they just don't know what to do to help their kids. So here's a list of a couple things you can do. Um, 
Regulating some of your own emotion can be very helpful here. If you have a hard time with blood draws or you bring a lot of stress and anxiety to the situation, your child's gonna feel that and realize, oh, I should be worked up about this. Mom or dad is worked up about this. So kind of everybody's stress and anxiety level rises. Um, communication with medical professionals is really helpful. Some of you have done this with your kids before. What worked, what didn't? Um, this is what we plan on doing to help them get through this and talk with that medical professional that's doing those blood draws or those IVs, any of those kind of things. Um, utilize or advocate for pain management. You know, we talked about the Buzzy, the LMX, the topical creams. Um, and then using positions of comfort. And then sometimes you have to be that distraction coach for them. Um, reminding them, let's look back at the I Spy book. Let's see if you can find the clown. Let's see if you, oh, the pretzel there. It looks like part of the fence post. Um, trying to keep them engaged in that distraction. And then this is one that I work really hard to do when I'm working with kids at the hospital is to really set the environment up for success. Um, so if you're sitting in the room with your child, they already have the part of their body exposed that they need to. They're already engaged in something that they enjoy or they're already um, playing or in a conversation and they're ready to go. They're sitting on your lap in the position you want them in. When that medical professional walks in with all that equipment that's so scary, you're already ready to go. So you don't now, after they've seen the equipment, they see the blood tubes, they maybe saw the needle, now we've got to get your shirt off, we've got to get you sitting where you need to be, we need to pull the tablet out. So that can be one piece that really minimizes the length of time something takes, which also minimizes the stress. And then this is something simple, but can be really helpful for kids. I call the hospitals have boring brown band-aids. Something as simple as having the My Little Pony or the Peppa Pig um, band-aids. It seems simple, but sometimes for kids, being able to pick a fun band-aid can be really helpful. So those are just kind of my thoughts, suggestions, ideas. Hopefully you had some tips that you were able to take away um, about blood draws. But does anyone have any comments or any questions? OK. Well, it was super great. And actually, I'm from Kansas City, so it was fun to see Children's oh, Mercy nice. featured great. up there. So yeah. So thank you so much for oh. taking your Saturday afternoon, Becky, to come and be with sure. us. Yeah, our kids, they face lots of things and fear of needles and blood draws. and. Um, infusions is one of them. So thank you so much for being here today. Help me thank Becky.